logging in now. I'm starting the webinar, so uh, mute yourself until you're ready to talk. Welcome everyone. We're going to get started in just a few, just a couple of minutes. All right, everyone, we're going to get started. Welcome, everyone, to the Center on Race and Social Problems at the University of Pittsburgh and to our fall institute entitled Race, Politics, and Fighting Voter Suppression. My name is Jay Hughley. I'm the interim director here at the Center on Race, and uh, we're very excited to bring you uh, this presentation, and I do so on behalf of of the university. As you may know, University of Pittsburgh is one of the national leaders in the conversation about race, anti-racism, fighting anti-Black racism, and the Center on Race and Social Problems is one of uh, our long-standing fixtures in this work. We've been doing this work for almost 20 years now here at our center. And uh, we're, we're supported by the Office of the Provost. We're housed in the School of Social Work and in the tradition of social work, we're very interdisciplinary and uh, looking at race and politics today. Why are we doing this now? Uh, the national conversation has been very clear that this is one of the most important elections, if not the most important election in, in most of our lifetimes. And there are a lot of racial implications. There are a lot of racial narratives. And so we wanna hit on those today we're very thankful to partner with the United Way of Southwestern Pennsylvania to bring you this event today. We heard this morning from Dr. Jacoba Williams of the Rand Corporation, some really amazing work on how historical patterns of lynching still impact the black vote today. In this session, we are again gonna tie the history of race and politics to the present. And we're, we're super excited to have a great speaker from one of the great um, 
places that cover this work in our in our nation. And um, before I'm getting ahead of myself because I really need to introduce you to my co-moderator, my co-host. You will be familiar with him if you follow our work. And that is Dr. John Wallace, who since we last, I don't know since we last spoke, but he's now Vice Provost John Wallace. Uh, and he's been working in communities of color for over 30 years, uh, doing research in, in community engaged practice. Dr. Wallace is ranked number five among scholarly productivity in African American faculty in the top 25 schools of social work. So he's a very serious researcher. He's been funded by the NIH, the NIMH, the King Mellon Foundation, the Heinz Endowments, and the Pittsburgh Foundation. He's co principal investigator on Pitt, Pitt assisted communities and schools. Very grounded in the community, very grounded in the research, champion for African American causes, and the vice provost for faculty diversity and development. So I want to welcome. Vice Provost Wallace, who will also introduce our speaker. How are you today? I'm great, Jay. Thanks for that overblown uh, introduction. I'm a Homewood, oh, Homewood Head Start graduate. That's who I am. But all that said, uh, thrilled to be here today to have the opportunity to introduce our speaker, Claire Malone. Claire is a senior politics writer at 538. She's famous, by the way, where she writes about electoral politics, class, and race in America, appears at the site's weekly podcast, her writing is everywhere, including New York Magazine, Harper's, The New Yorker, The New York Times. And uh, prior to 538, she worked at The New Yorker and American Prospect. She's a graduate of Georgetown University and a native of Ohio. She didn't go to Ohio State, so I am allowed to have this conversation. <laughs> go blue. <laughs> go ahead, Claire. No, co no comment. Well, welcome to Pittsburgh. I understand. You got to protect yourself. I understand. Welcome to Pittsburgh. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's great to be here virtually. <laughs> Oh, oh, we're going to do this uh, in a conversational fashion. And then, Claire, the first question that, you know, I think is on, a, on top of a lot of our minds when we think about race and we think about the major political parties and something that you, you've really been uh, thinking about and looking into and researching is this notion that the Republican Party is the party of Lincoln. And I mean, and it was the party of racially progressive politics in the 19th century. But when people look today, they don't, it doesn't look that way. And there seems to have been a shift where there's the perception that, you know, Democrats are the more racially progressive party. And a lot of your work sort of talks about this transition in this timeline. So I just kind of want to open up and ask, what has happened, what's factor fiction and what has happened in that transition if there's been one uh, around the racial progression of these major parties? Yeah. Um... I mean, I think so often the, the most interesting things that I write stories about or do reporting on come from these um, stereotypes or preconceived notions that we have about American politics or just accepted conventional wisdom. So, um, so most recently this summer, I, I did a long piece about um, the GOP and basically that, right? It's history with race, with, with, with sort of um, courting white voters and very aggressively either ignoring black voters or trying to suppress the vote of black voters. And, and the idea for this piece, and I'll, I'll go through and, and, and talk a little bit more about um, the history of the Republican party and, and black Americans. But the idea for this piece came out of, you know, my editor and I were talking about, this is, you know, back in, in the beginning of the pandemic, uh, President Trump was doing a lot of talk about, you know, dismissing out of hand vote by mail and same day registration, all of this stuff that was you know, supposed to help people vote during, you know, a pandemic. And he said this, he said, quote, they had things, levels of voting that if you would ever agree to it, you'd never have a Republican elected in this country again. And basically a lot of people took that to mean, and I took it to mean um, that there's a political wisdom that's ingrained that when black and brown people vote, they don't vote for Republicans. And there's a lot of Republican strategy over the past century that's kind of flowed from that conventional wisdom. And that's the conventional wisdom now, right? Is that, you know, I think, you know, Joe Biden sort of famously clumsily said it on a radio show earlier this year. He said like, you ain't black, if you don't vote, if you vote for Trump, uh, you ain't black, right? right. right. Which obviously <laughs> rubbed a lot of people the wrong way. Um, but, you know, obviously Lincoln was a Republican um, and, and 
the uh, the affinity that Black Americans felt for the Republican Party, the party um, that abolished slavery or helped abolish slavery, was pretty strong for a really long time. And I, I won't bore everyone with going into to the 19th century, but let's go to 1940. Um, you know, we're we're in the middle of a world war, a depression, and FDR is doing quite a lot to court a pretty big coalition, a coalition of um, Black Ameri Americans, a coalition of these, you know, what people would call ethnic whites. So people who would live in places like Pittsburgh and Cleveland, Irish, German, Slovenian, Polish. Um, and Black party identification in 1940 is split between Democrats and Republicans. So, you know, your grandparents might have been alive when um, half of the Black people in this country would have considered voting for a Republican. Um, Move forward a little bit. In 1956, Dwight Eisenhower uh, got 40% of the Black vote. So we're in the 50s, we're in the civil rights era, and uh, Republicans are still doing pretty well uh, with Black voters. In fact, um, my sort of favorite fact of, around this era is that um, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s father was a Republican and actually considered voting for Richard Nixon in 1960, um, but then JFK called his son, while well, his son was was in prison, and and that swung uh, the father's vote for for the Democrats. So there were a lot of there were a lot of Black Americans who were still very much split in the mid century. Um, you know, even in 1960, you have Richard Nixon saying, um, "I I lost in part because I didn't go hard enough after the Black vote." Um, and I'm gonna I'm gonna do that annoying thing where I quote a little bit from one of my my pieces because I think the that you know even in the in the mid century when um, black voters are still, you know, decently attuned to the Republican party, the Republican party wasn't particularly attuned to them. Um, and, and, you know, Dwight Eisenhower had uh, the first African-American to serve in, a, in an executive staff position at the White House. This guy's name was E. Frederick Morrow. And he uh, gave a speech in 1959 where he basically said that the Republicans were too apathetic towards black voters. And he said, Republicans could not expect Negroes to be extremely grateful for what Lincoln did, since in effect, he had nearly returned to them their God-given rights of freedom and personal dignity. So basically this black Republican is making the argument of, you can't just coast on Lincoln, right? Forever. And uh, I'll speed up a little bit here. You get to uh, 1964, which is kind of the big year for um, race and political parties in America, because you have Barry Goldwater as the Republican nominee running on the ex pretty explicitly racist Southern strategy. Um, you have Southern, you know, Democrats for a long time had been the party of segregation in the South, the term Dixiecrats, right? So 64 and, and that early 60s period when um, the civil rights, what would become the Civil Rights Act is, you know, there's there's debate going on in DC about it. Certain Democrats, including John Kennedy, are a little bit tepid in the way that they're approaching that bill. And but you're but you're seeing a lot of Southern Democrats say, I don't think this is my party anymore. And they're saying it explicitly because of race. And Barry Goldwater swept up a bunch of those people in 1964. He lost. Um, but that kind of started to open up for Republicans a certain sense that perhaps an easy way to win votes is to go after a white vote in the South that is racist. Um, and you see that in 1968, um, kind of, you know, there was, a, there was a period after Goldwater lost pretty, pretty profoundly where some Republicans, including uh, Mitt Romney's father, George Romney, for the Michiganders in the room, um, was, the, was the governor of Michigan and was a pretty moderate Republican. He was for the civil rights bill, um, you know, he, he would serve later as, as uh, Nixon's uh, HUD director and was, was decently progressive about re uh, residential uh, integration and, and kind of got kicked out of Nixon's cabinet because of his racial progressivism. Um, but Romney was basically saying, we should, we should be more racially progressive. And he did not win that argument within the Republican party. Uh, Nixon became the nominee. He ran on a, uh, not just a let's win the Southern white vote, but also let's win the uh, Northern white vote. Um, and there was a certain amount of, there's, there's some interesting, you know, if you, if you deep dive Time Magazine from 1966, there's this article that talks about 
the fracturing of FDR's, you know, famous Democratic coalition. And they say one of the ways for Republicans to, um, to pick up on those ethnic white votes is to play to the racial fears of whites in the North. So, you know, Boston, uh, Pittsburgh, Cleveland, you know, all of these places, Chicago, um, people who, to, for whom the, the Nixon law and order message really resonated. And you're kind of, from there, you're a little bit in autopilot. You know, there are, that, that Democrats become the party of racial progressivism and Republicans do not. There are some bumps along the way. I think there's a really interesting um, moment in 1978 when Jesse Jackson um, appears, is invited to appear before the RNC to speak. And he basically says, you guys are leaving a lot of black votes on the table. I'm not gonna say you're gonna win every single black vote, but you could do a lot better. And uh, the RNC chairman comes out after that Jesse Jackson speech and, and tells the New York Times, you know what, the right, uh, the right candidate in 1980, the right GOP candidate in 1980 could win 30 to 40% of the black vote. Well, Ronald Reagan was the Republican nominee in 1980 and he won 14% of the black vote. And, and Reagan obviously came from that really conservative uh, Barry Goldwater Southern strategy message. Now Reagan was, and I'm almost done here in my long first answer. Reagan was, um, as we have all heard over and over again, the great communicator, right? And I think he understood that as the country, the country's culture got more um, broadly progressive, right? The eighties were the heyday for, um, you know, the, there, was, there was just a lot less tolerance for open, uh, the open rhetoric of racism in the 1980s. And so Reagan kind of soft peddled things, but he was certainly speaking a language, I think that many people recognized as being, a, if, you were, if you were attuned to some of the Republican party, um, you know, rhetoric of the, of the 1960s, Reagan certainly came from that tradition. And, you know, if, if people in Pittsburgh are, are familiar with the phenomenon of uh, Reagan Democrats, right? Ronald Reagan um, did the same strategy of picking up these people in what we now call the, you know, the blue wall states of Michigan, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin. Reagan did a good job of picking up white voters who had traditionally voted Democratic again and saying, you know, listen, I'm, I'm a cultural conservative. You kind of get what I'm saying. And I think from the 1980s onward, um, you have a pretty, um, you kind of have that solidified conventional wisdom that the Republican Party doesn't court black voters. You know, you did actually have the 19, in 19, not 1995, 2005, the RNC chairman went before the NAACP and apologized for the Southern strategy. But people said, you know, is he just doing that to court suburban white voters who want to know that they're not voting for a, you know, explicitly racist party? So that's kind of the, the, the long circuitous answer of how we got to this 2020 solidified conventional wisdom that Donald Trump certainly believes in, which is Republicans can't really win black voters. So, I mean, when we look at uh, the African-American population, largely very conservative around moral issues and so forth. So how is it that the Republican party totally leaves that on the table? And then on the flip side, I mean, when we look at the data, has the Democratic party been all of that great for black people either from your perspective? Yeah, I mean, this is exactly what Jesse Jackson was saying in 1978. And I think, you know, there's a, um, he, he was, he was at that point. Still a Jackson from a right around some pretty like, you know, conservative, um, a woman's place is in the home. Uh, oh, can you guys hear me? I think maybe I, yeah. yeah okay, good. Um, so so J Jesse Jackson was certainly um, a person who was saying to Republicans, listen, there are conservative strains within um, the black community that you can pick up on. It's the same, okay. it's the same, yeah, it's the same play that um, let's say George W. Bush and Karl Rove made about let's win Hispanic voters, right? There was a, there was a big conversation um, when Bush ran for president in 2000 that he was going to make the Republican party a diverse place because Hispanic voters were natural conservatives because they were religious. You could make the same argument about, about, about black voters, right? And I think that's oh, sort of- absolutely. What, I yeah, mean, what, nationally, there's, there's no one in America more religious than black people. 
Yeah. And so the fact that the Republican Party, you would think, given that that's part of the, the storyline, that there would be some connection there, but it's totally, totally missed and no effort made to address it. But like I say, on the flip side, when you look at the, the Democratic Party, uh, that tends to not be an issue that people were concerned about. But not, back to your point, th does this allegiance or apparent allegiance to the, dis to the Democratic Party, does that serve Black people well or what you read? This is the, the complicated question, which is um, black, the black vote in this country, you know, accounting for the fact that people are idiosyncratic and all that stuff, but they, it mostly votes for Democrats. I do think there is something to be said for, you know, what Charlemagne the God basically was saying to Joe Biden in that, that interview, um, <laughs> which is, yeah, there's, there's, there's some sense that potentially that the, the establishment part of the Democratic Party um, doesn't go out and in for this for the special interest needs of black voters because they don't need to because it's a captured constituency potentially you you're maybe seeing some of that change i mean i think this summer has obviously been a summer of pretty big racial unrest and there is you know if if the democrats let's say win the white house and the senate that means for at least two years they would hold all of government and maybe there would be a policing reform bill maybe there would be some you know some sense that um, some of the explicit demands of the black community would be met. Now, I think other people would say, well, what about a reparations bill, right? What about some of these proposals that people have put on the table that, 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 that are a bit more um, radical in the eyes of the establishment Democratic Party? I don't think that those things are, are on the table right now, mm -hmm. um, in part because I think the country is, you know, it's, these, it's politics, right? You still want to win all these these swing states, which are filled with a lot of probably conservative leaning white voters. Um, but I think there's a really strong case to be made that, you know, the, 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 the black vote in the country, if the Republicans had, you know, 50 years ago, gone harder after it, after it, Democrats would maybe have to work more to meet the needs, some of the specific needs of black communities in America. And that's just the way, you know, power politics work. I want to jump in with a uh, question from one of our uh, attendees, and I, and I had a very similar question to this. Like when we think about the Democratic Party, um, and we think about like the, the flip side of that Southern strategy, you know, then the Democratic Party pivoted from being the party of segregation to the party it is today. Was that was that strategic, or was that sort of de facto? Did that just happen, or did the Democrats stand on a moral high ground and say we need to be the party of everyone? Or was it sort of, well, here's the, the, the inverse strategy to what they're doing or, or something more complicated? I think there were certainly, um, there were certainly choices made in the 1960s by, by political figures in the Democratic Party. I mean, Kennedy, when he died, had, had sort of finally accepted a more, you know, we're gonna go forward with this legislative strategy, but there were the white leadership of the Democratic Party, while it was sympathetic to civil rights, I think was very worried, frankly, as the as the, the political establishment of the Democratic Party is today, which by the way includes a lot of black politicians, was very sensitive to the way that white voters would receive that big change. So Kennedy kind of famously was really worried about the March on Washington, was worried that it was gonna scare people. So there, there was a certain hesitancy, but I, I think obviously, you know, Lyndon Johnson owned that sort of these big potential reasons ego too, but owned this big idea of social programs and big change. And so I do think that there was a conscious effort on the part of Democrats to say like, yes, um, we are going to be this party. This is sort of a belief that we have. Um, you know, it was it was sort of set on that track, I think, by FDR and this idea that the Democratic Party was a big tent. You know, the Democratic Party was for the poor whites, the Okies fleeing to California, and it was for, you know, the black people moving from the South to Northern cities, that this was a, a party whose policies were economic, right? That they were, um, that, that, that they were going to reach all people through these, these economic and social programs. Um, but, you know, when the, Dix, when the, when the Dixiecrats kind of switched over to the Republicans, certainly there's a, there's a power, power balance that you have to, you know, really take into consideration. So 
I think with all of these things, there's often the parties have a, a, a it's in the parties that are that are going in a certain direction and and often you just kind of the strategic push follows. Dr. Wallace, you're muted. A lot of conversation going on now around voter fraud, right? This is yeah. this is not a new thing by any stretch of the imagination. Um, why why do you think this issue has such sticky power? Why is it uh, you know such a powerful kind of perspective on politics, and why the concern? Yeah, the the um, the history around voter fraud is really interesting. And um, one thing I like to point out is in 1977, uh, uh, Jimmy Carter put forth a big package of basically voting reforms, democracy reforms. And uh, it included, you know, universal same day registration. The Jesse Jeffy of said, this is a great idea. Universal same day registration is a Republican idea. Well, he ends up talking to Ronald Reagan, has a meeting with him, comes out of the meeting and says, actually, we're against this. We're worried about voter fraud. So voter fraud started to be a buzzword kind of in the Reagan era. It had certainly happened before. I mean, if you um, kind of the, the dog whistle about um, voter fraud was, you know, when Republican politicians talked about it, had to do with Chicago. They would say Chicago, you know, which, which was basically availed. The, the activities in Chicago, um, were were usually had to do with like corrupt democratic politicians, black voter voting blocks, places where um, democratic machine politics was rigging the vote for their candidates. Now, I will say, American politics and the Democrats included, there is a there is a history of you know rigged elections, democratic machine politics, right, all of that stuff. Um, but I would say in the second half of the twentieth century, that isn't really a thing that that happens much at all anymore. There was a, there was an analysis done um, by a scholar back in 2014 or 2015. And it was something like of the, you know, billion something ballots, a crazy number of ballots cast in the last 30 years, there have been something like 30 credible instances of, of voter fraud. Very, very, very slim um, evidence to show that, that voter fraud actually exists. But it's a compelling talking point for people because it has the veneer of um, concern about democracy, right? It's the, it's the kind of pearl clutching that, that gives, you know, people a credible, you know, way to say, well, don't you want to ensure that, that the vote is, um, is correct, that we are not taking any chances with democracy, right? That, that we need to be rigorous in the way that we regulate democracy. And I think a lot of people, Democrat or Republican, would say voting is a right that we have. Voting should be easy. You shouldn't, you know, we've, we've made laws in this country against poll taxes. Um, you know, we, we have a long history around the racialized um, sort of, you know, hoops to jump through in order to vote. Mm -hmm. um, but, that, but that veneer of don't you want to protect democracy is, I think, a very powerful piece of, of rhetoric that has been thrown around for quite a long time. Do you think, how much do you think um, of this voter fraud sort of uh, pull in terms of electoral politics is a knowing deception uh, given what the real rates of voter fraud are or in how much of it is sort of people just going along with a story that's, that's not well supported uh, not, not, not knowingly being deceptive, but just thinking, just assuming that this is actually, you know, a, a substantial problem. I think that's a, that's a, that's a great, I, think, I think that a lot of Republican politicians or a lot of Republic, a lot of Republican voters, because again, this is the Republican party that's mostly um, putting this line out there. A lot of them legitimately believe that they're, that, that these concerns about voter fraud are true. Now, one of the reasons why um, I think that that has been per perpetuated is that the right has done a really good job of setting up, um, you know, what someone once called shadow academic organizations. So a place like the Heritage Foundation, which was founded in the late 70s, early 80s, um, you know, has this sort of notorious scholar 
Hans von Spakovsky, who worked for George W. Bush, who was a, you know, a poll watcher in, in Georgia, um, who, who, who has um, made a career of, of basically, um, I would say, peddling actual stream accepted findings about voter fraud I and, and and other other conservatives but but there is a certain um think tank industrial complex that um you know finds the examples the rare examples of voter fraud and plays them up and um and I think that there are a lot of Republicans who um fall back on that because you know the thing about about some of these like voter law cases is that election law as we're all, I think, about to learn in the next, you know, two weeks to a month, however this election, election law really and harsh through and one of those. There's lots of parts, you know, I I'd lay in the weeds, and so. You can go on cable news and make a point that sounds right, you know, but it, but there might be evidence that says like, easy to repeat the talking points and you believe in voter fraud. And I think a lot of Democrats would say like, that kind of basic underlying universal, hopefully, democratic principle that all people should be able to vote and vote easily and vote fairly, that rhetoric has sort of been corrupted by partisanship, which is, you know, a damn shame, but true. And, and that's the, the rhetoric of politics is that sometimes the most um, pernicious and convincing political rhetoric is the stuff that, that takes those fundamental democratic principles and makes them code words for different sorts of things. Um, I want to ask one more, one more uh, um, follow up about this. You know, people, I mean, there's the assumption that high voter turnout, and you talk about this in your work, that, high, that people believe the high voter turnout is automatically going to be democratic victories. Is that, is that true? Is that fair to say? Because I mean, there, I've also heard this argument that there are uh, folks that are, that, that Trump's path forward is to tap into this uh, disaffected white population that can still be rallied and bring in a, a bunch of additional votes for him that haven't previously been accounted for. So is, is that a given that this high voter turnout is definitely a democratic swing? Um. No, I mean, here's what I'll say. Uh, I think we can across the board expect that like 2016, 2020, we'll see very high levels of turnout across the board. Um, I think just to address mail, mail voting for a second, you know, um, we're, there's no conclusive evidence that it benefits either party. So while the Republicans have kind of gone all in on trying to um, restrict mail voting this time around, even though prior to 2020, it was a pretty bipartisan, not pretty, it was a pretty, it was a bipartisan, um, just kind of, you know, the bureaucracy of elections kind of issue. Uh, we do not know whether or not mail voting will benefit, mail in voting will benefit one party or another. Although we do know that Democrats seem to be voting at a higher mail in rate at, at this point in time. What I would say about the kind of, um, you know, is Trump's path forward, these uncount these these white voters who are uncounted in the polls i think my simple answer is is no for a couple reasons one is, is that um a lot of some some of trump supporters were missed by polls in 2016 because um for kind of some of the boring complicated reasons of uh polling models were weighting incor maybe incorrectly for education level. So a better way to put it is, we learned a lot in 2016 about what your level of education and race say about who you're likely to vote for. 
So if you were a white person with a college education, you are now much more likely to vote for a Democrat. And if you were a white person without a college education, you are much more likely to vote for a Republican. And that was not always the case. Education didn't used to be a very a super determining factor. So in 2020, the polls have tried to take into the, that into account. But also in 2016, you know, when, when pollsters survey people, they go after the universe of likely voters. And that basically just means, have you voted in the past couple of elections? Great, we're probably gonna call you. Um, but Trump was, as we all remember, a phenom, right? He was also had like universal name recognition. People had known him for decades and decades. And so people who hadn't voted, who weren't in that you know, universe of likely voters that pollsters would poll, came out and registered and voted for Trump. So there were some votes that were missed. Um, but you know, we are seeing right now that like there isn't a lot of shy Trump support. If you're a Trump supporter, and people might know this from their personal life, you're probably not shy about it. You're probably going to tell a pollster. Um, I don't think we're seeing a lot of you know social stigma necessarily around that. Um, and I think what what Trump's past path forward really is is um, is trying to win some of those um, white suburban independents who typically might lean conservative, but this time around are leaning towards the Democratic side, probably in part because Joe Biden is a pretty conventional, older white guy politician who people are sort of used to seeing after decades and decades in American life. So, so related to that, so if you think about uh, four years ago at this time, we were looking at the data, looking at the polls, and everybody was pretty confident that Hillary Clinton was just going to walk away with this thing. But social media was telling a very different story, right? And so as we look at the data today, it appears that Biden is up, you know, by 10, 12%, uh, all the different polls and so forth. Uh, but does that mean anything? I mean, are the polling data helpful anymore? Or have things changed, particularly given that, uh, again, social media and where people are spending their time and all of that is very different particularly in the middle of a pandemic. So what are your thoughts? Do, do these polls really mean anything or is it really uh, up in the air and only time will tell? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think we should, here's what I'll say, which is um, I, I think currently the 538's polling model gives, tr gives Biden an 80, 88 times out of 100 times in simulations, Biden will win the presidency. But that still means that Trump has a, has a chance and a decent chance of winning the presidency. I think so. So I don't want to say, you know, Biden's a for sure shoe in. Um, but there are some things that make where we are two weeks out from the election a little bit different from where we were in 2016, two weeks out from the election. Um, one of those differences is that in 2016, there were a really, really high number of undecided voters or voters who were voting for a a third party candidate. And we don't have that this time around. So even though Biden has around the same chance that, that Clinton did at this time of, of winning the election, um, people are snapped into their decision. You're either Trump or you're Biden. You probably have an opinion about this. You know, we are, I th and I think, you know, to your point about social media, I think even in these four years we've progressed, and I think this is a bad thing, so much so much into the um, the partisan bubble world, the this is my worldview, that's your worldview. Um, I was actually looking this morning at um, Gallup, which is a pollster, uh, was had released um, the public opinion polls of uh, the American public's views on whether or not Supreme Court nominees going back to, I think the late 1980s should be approved and um, a Republican senator tweeted it out and said, 51% of the American public thinks that Amy Coney Barrett should be a Supreme Court justice. Okay, great. 46% said she shouldn't be. And there was maybe like 1%, 2% that was undecided. If you go back and look even at Kavanaugh, you know, obviously Kavanaugh was an interesting experience, but there were tons more undecided people about Kavanaugh, whether or not Kavanaugh should be approved. And if you, and as you go down through the Obama era, you know, maybe, a, maybe a, a slight majority or a plurality of people said, yes, this person should be approved, but never as high as 46% saying this person should never get onto the court. And I think those numbers tell us a lot about where we are mindset wise going into the election. So I think that there's a little bit more certainty in the polls. Again, caveat, 
Trump still has a chance of winning the election. Um, but that's, I think, the, the difference between 2016. And it has a lot to do with the way that the Trump years have, have shaped our, our political brains. We have, um, so several people in the, in the audience are um, interested. And I, I do wanna say, if you have questions for Clem alone, please go ahead and send them in in the Q&A. That's probably the best way. Uh, people are asking about whether or not, you know, the Democratic Party is actually an effective party uh, for the African-American interest and in alluding to what Dr. Uh, Wallace uh, mentioned earlier. And one of the questions is, has the Democratic Party moved away uh, from working class issues and how does this affect, um, you know, Black America and the Black agenda? And you, you have any uh, thoughts on that? Has, has the Democratic Party ceased to be the party of working class folks? Um, it's a good it's a good Pennsylvania question, right? Because it, <laughs> because I feel like whenever you know whenever politicians come to Pennsylvania, Joe Biden's always talking about um, you know the working class Scranton roots. Um, but I think it's a good question. Here's what I'll say. Uh, here's what I'll start with, which is I think it's sort of in our field that politics in America has become nationalized, and that means that the national perception of Democrats. I think is a loaded term that you either really like too much on abortion and gay marriage and being woke and you know abolishing ice and abolishing the police and it doesn't care about you know my bread and butter economic policy issues i think that's that's um that's one read on the um on the national identity of the democratic party i think that trump has done a lot to kind of you know put out a populist rhetoric around the republican party but there is that I think is more attuned to having policy goals that are centered around um, the middle class still. Like, I think that identity is still pretty strong within the party. I mean, Trump, there were certainly, I think the big, the big policy, um, someone said this to me, a source I was talking to said this to me the other day, and I think it's probably true that the Trump administration's big policy things were a tax cut um, that did largely benefit um, people in higher income brackets and putting judicial nominees out there. Um, I think to, to go to the, the racial part of this question, which is, um, you know, are the Democrats still the party of the working class? I mean, yes, but I think that, that, um, that potentially their national identity of being the woke party has sort of overshadowed that. And again, this is such a tricky territory because like, I think that woke is a, is a pejorative often, and it doesn't really get into what you're talking about. But, you know, um, I think Warren was interesting as a Democratic candidate because she talked a lot about the way that policy, economic policy issues tied to race. So she had this program about redlining. She talked a lot about um, the lack of, of, of home equity and long-term wealth within intergenerational wealth in black families. Um, and, and frankly, like the way that American suburbs and cities have been structured to, um, to, to be discriminatory and to cut off long-term wealth of minority communities. And I thought Warren was interesting in talking about that. And I think you see some of that in Bernie Sanders, where Sanders will sometimes say, uh, yes, I agree with gay marriage. And yes, I agree, agree with, you know, these woke reforms, but let's talk about the economics of it. And I think that's probably the direction that a lot of Democrats, both in the establishment and the kind of like um, progressive left would like to see, like they would like to see more focus on policy issues. But I also think that there's a lot of um, identity issues that have bubbled up and are important to people and, and they want to see addressed. So it's kind of a, I mean, I've given a long answer, but it's kind of a sticky, complicated question. A good one though. 
There are there are folks that are asking questions that relate to sort of the future of the parties, and you know, with um, there there's the you have the you know, and on the Democratic side you have the moderate Dems and you have a very strong and growing maybe progressive branch of the party, and people are having conversations now. Do we see this in the future as a as a two party? Um, Society or uh, more major parties, or are there are other parties, or are we moving more towards a splintering? And that there might be three parties, and you know, part of that is what we were just talking about is the moderate Democrat platform really uh, doing enough to address racial equity, uh, racial justice, and anti-black racism in particular. Do you see? Yeah, the chance that we might see an evolution in how the parties are configured. As, and with race as a part of that, that change. Yeah. My short answer is I don't think that we will be anything other than a two party system realistically, because it takes a lot of, it takes a lot, a lot to make a, to make a whole new third party. But I think, um, you know, right now you're, you know, I'm talking to people who are in democratic politics who are, all pretty sure that Biden is going to win the presidency. And now what they're all thinking about is, okay, what do we do for the two years where we might hold power? And when you talk to a lot of the younger progressive people, a lot of the people who are attached to, you know, say the, the politics of the squad, right? Presley or AOC, um, people who have made racial justice issues a big part of their platform. A lot of what they're focused on is, there's some, you know, they have some sense of, okay, we'd like to get some, um, you know, policies in a, in a COVID stimulus bill that help minority uh, workers, particularly frontline workers who are obviously mostly um, people of color, particularly in cities like I'm in New York. Um, you know, you only see people, you, you basically don't see white people on the subway going to work. It's only people of color. So, so, so addressing some of those frontline worker issues. But then a lot of what you see from these younger, younger progressive people is a focus on, we want to staff offices and get judicial nominees in the pipeline for the next 10, 20, 30 years who are black and brown people who are, who are um, not you know, working for white shoe law firms who have civil rights backgrounds, who basically have a different worldview and their sense of things is that they're seeding, they're seeding the democratic um, policy world, very different worldview from the current democratic establishment. So what I think will probably happen is that, um, you know, groups like, uh, so there's a group called Justice Democrats, which is the group that um, basically picked AOC and said, we're gonna, we're gonna help you run for office. That group is focusing on winning primaries with more progressive candidates in safe democratic seats. So, you know, New York, Illinois, we, we've got a mainstream middle-aged Democrat. Okay, we're going we're gonna to replace you with, um, you know, a younger Black woman who's a nurse, right? So I think that's going to be the way that you'll see the progressive movement in the Democratic Party change is that it will not form a, you know, a democratic socialist you know, new party, it's going to try to work to, to basically build from within. Um, and, and I think that's probably the most realistic scenario. We have, um, we have uh, an audience member who says, as a Democrat who's voted for three Republican candidates in general elections dating back to 1976, it seems that the Republican Party election after election seeks to sabotage American democracy by building bogus walls of voter suppression. If the Republicans wish to become a bigger tent, the policies they promote should become more appealing to all populations of this country instead of primarily white people. In other words, Republicans should rethink what kind of party they are and what kind of party they wish to be. And you, you talk about the history of this choice, which is very, you know, the word you use around the Republican Party and race. Do you see, well, let me, let me, let me fold that into an important question. Do you see that uh, this, this election as a potential 
if Biden wins, this is sort of a last stand for like the Southern strategy that I think this, this, this comment alludes to. It's one of the big unknowns. I mean, I think this, so um, I'm not sure, you know, if, if, if Trump loses, I don't think Trump will go away. And I don't, I think it's probably pretty likely that at least one of the, you know, couple, a couple of the people running for the Republican nomination in, in 2024 would be Trumpy Republicans, right? This kind of more populist, um, anti-immigrant, um, dog whistling kind of sensibility. But I, I think that there's also a really big part of the Republican party that is dismayed at the direction that the party is going. And it's not just for moral reasons. I mean, I think, I think certainly some, some Republicans do have real moral issues with what Trump is doing. But also if you look back at uh, in 2012, obviously Mitt Romney lost the election. In the few months after he lost the election, the Republican party wrote something that came to be known as the 2012 GOP autopsy. And it was basically, why did we lose? And the conclusion that they came to was in part, not in part, in large part, um, is that the party was too focused on being exclusionary, that they needed to have um, more welcoming, welcoming policies for people of color. They needed to have a softer line on immigration um, and it's frankly one of the reasons why Marco Rubio and Ted Cruz, who are both Hispanic, were initially considered, you know, 2020, I mean, 2016 front runners because um, the party wanna, wanted to kind of go back to the George W. Bush era thing of, hey, the GOP should win these culturally conservative Hispanic voters. Um, I think there are a lot of Republicans who would love to do that in part because the demographic reality of the United States is that white people will no longer be the majority in 2040, or that's the US census projection. So that's a whole new ball game. And if Democrats are, I like to say politics is hereditary. Right? I'm, from, I'm from white Irish Catholics in Cleveland, Ohio. My family voted Democratic. If you are a, uh, person of Mexican heritage living in Texas, you probably will vote Democratic, but there's actually quite a lot of Hispanic Republicans in Texas or more than you'd think. Um, so there are places where Republicans have a chance to make inroads, but people, in, people tend to inherit the politics of their families. And so if you are seeding racially <laughs> insensitive policies or policies that are exclusionary or alienating to minority communities, well, 20 years from now, you're not gonna have much of a chance with those constituencies. So there's a lot of Republicans who are thinking strategically about that and saying, yikes, um, what are we gonna do in the next 10, 15, 20 years? Um, one question that's coming is, you know, when we have these conversations and talk about Biden being highly likely to win, uh, will, will, that, will that cause, um, can that, can that potentially contribute to low voter turnout because people assume he's going to win and then it's not as urgent for me to show up when the polls are what they are right now? Um, you know, that's, that's certainly, often we'll hear like in, in normal elections on election night, there's a, there's a rule that all the major networks have where they, they kind of try not to call certain states before certain other states in different time zones vote because there is a concern that campaigns have about like, oh, people will stay home, they won't vote, they won't feel like their vote counts. I think this year is, is kind of a different ball game because so many people are, A, it's just like a, people are very tuned into this election. People are highly motivated to vote. Um, but also so many people have already voted. I think something like 30 million people have already cast their ballots. Um, so I, I don't necessarily think that that has an effect this year in particular, just because of the kind of bizarre circumstances of our election. Um, we had a really, really riveting speaker this morning, who, uh, Jacoba Williams from Rand Corporation, and she talked about 
how voter suppression tactics of the past uh, still statistically, and she's an economist, still stand today and account for um, sort of um, voting, voting attitudes in the black community even today. And one of the questions from the audience is that, uh, do you think that a memory of a different type of or an extreme voter fraud from past eras uh, make black voters weary today of these accusations of voter fraud that it could, I guess, maybe have a disproportionate effect in communities where they have been uh, suppressed in the past, thinking that their vote will be suppressed uh, and therefore maybe less likely to engage. Does, what do you think about that? I think it's a really valid concern. I mean, one of the um, one of the tactics that that the Trump campaign took in 2016, which they were very open about, was they bought up um, ad space on largely like black affiliated radio stations and played and replayed Hillary Clinton's super predator comment about young black men from from around 1994. Now, obviously, she game on social media and in radio campaigns there was basically this you know this idea that played into so the both the trump campaign and frankly like you know those russian bots that we all hear about those russian bots were largely focused on suppressing the black vote in certain areas right basically saying like either directing people to you know vote in a way that you can't vote by you can't vote on your phone you have to mail in a ballot um or saying, or, or basically putting out comments like the super predator comment to say, listen, Democrats don't care about you. And I think that those play into very real, I mean, we spent very real fears and logical concerns that the black community has. We've talked about how, you know, the democratic party knows that they have the black vote on lock or, and, and so like there are logical conclusions that people can make that say like, well, my vote doesn't matter. And I think it's lots of Americans who feel like that, but certainly black Americans in particular. I mean, and there's, you know, I think there's a long and, and particularly right now, a disturbing history of, of, of distrust that people have in government for good reasons. You know, at, at 538, we spent a lot of time also covering COVID-19. And, and right now we're talking about vaccine acceptance in the United States, which has obviously become highly politicized but also particularly within the black community, there's a really long history of people being correct and not trusting the government. This, this Tuskegee Institute syphilis study, right? The, you know, people aren't wrong to, know, to say that like the government hasn't treated them well in the past. And in fact, you know, knowingly hurt them. So it's, it's a really tricky issue and history lives within us, right? Like politics is genetic and ancestral and so is distrust. Um, so I think it's a, it's a completely valid thing. I would hope that people vote, you know, that's, bec that's become, I feel like saying you should vote has become a politicized thing. But I think, you know, I'm a, I'm a journalist. I kind of, my job relies on the constitution. I feel okay saying, I hope you vote. I hope you, you know, I hope you don't feel um, like your vote doesn't count, but you know, people are people are smart and logical, and 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 have reasons for doing these things. And there are malicious actors who play into those things for nefarious reasons. So, real quick, what's the likely response? So, you give us your ten seconds. So, Biden wins, Trump wins. How do you feel the country is going to respond? What what's the fourth of November going to look like? We have a clear answer about who wins the election on the fourth. I think, I think you're gonna see a lot of video images of, of rejoicing New York City streets. And I think you're gonna see a lot of Donald Trump on potentially on Fox and Friends saying, this isn't legitimate. And the other way around, I think, you know, um, I think it, it'll be, you know, 2016 all over again for, for Democrats. And a lot of, you know, we told you so from, from the Trump team. Thank you. Let me, let me ask one final question. What do you think um, is the most important thing people can do between now and November 3rd? We've got two weeks to 
um, get the vote out, vote ourselves. We are advocating for that here. Um, and um, regardless of party affiliation and, and you know political positions, but what, do you, what, what would you advise people between now and November 3rd? Yeah, I mean, just, you know, I'm also pro-voting, no matter who you vote for. So I would say, uh, figure out where your polling location is, or if you want to vote by mail, you're probably running out of time a little bit. But if you go to 538, we have a state by state resource for how to vote by mail and links to take you there. So, so please Google that. Um, but I think, you know, I would also say to, to Dr. Wallace's question about um, what does November 4th look like? I would also say we have two weeks left. Um, we all talk to our family and friends about the election stuff. And I think probably everyone is anxious. And I would say to people to, to sit with themselves and think about what happens if things don't go the way I want them to go on November 4th. What's my reaction and, and what's my mindset going to be? Because I think part of, part of 2016 was that it was, it was a surprise for everyone. And um, I think that led to uh, a lot of anxiety and a lot of confusion. And I guess I would say to people, you should, you should know that there's a good chance that Trump, that Biden will win. And there's also a decent chance that Trump will win. So I think people should acclimate themselves to that reality. In addition to having a voting plan, knowing where you're gonna vote on, on November 3rd, Googling it if you don't, um, but also, also knowing that there's a possibility that your candidate won't win. With that, we are out of time. I wanna thank you, Claire, for sharing very deep and enlightening conversation going over basically over more than 100 years of history and how things play out today and what matters in, in voting across the parties and the history of the parties and how that plays out uh, for race. And so thank you so much for joining us. You can follow uh, Claire Malone's work uh, on Twitter and, and at 538.com. And we have one more panel today at 2 p.m. You can follow all of our events at um, facebook.com slash pit crisp. Uh, and you can follow us on Twitter and we'll make sure you stay abreast of everything. So thank you again, Dr. Wallace. Thank you. Thank you. Sir. Way, thank you. And we'll see you all in just another hour. Thank, thank you for having me. All right. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.